Hello and welcome to the Commander's Quarters, your Magic the Gathering source that helps you command your budget. This show and episodes like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. If you're looking for an easy way to help support this show, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that bell notification icon so you don't miss any new episodes. You can also go check out our playmats and other merchandise at thecommandersquarters.com. Another easy way to support this show is with our TCG Player affiliate links. So whether you're buying a deck or individual cards, you can use this general link right here or one in the description. And the final way that you can support this show is by supporting us directly by becoming a patron. There are many benefits to being a patron, and I truly couldn't do this without all their support. There's even a brand new Brigadier General tier where you can get a shout out on a Commander's Quarters episode that's dedicated to you. Hey everyone, Mitch coming in from the Commander's Quarters studio. Welcome to the show. So on today's episode, just like the thumbnail as well as the title of this episode say, I'm going to be taking you through my new favorite deck. I have built a ton of decks in my time as a Commander player, and this one has quickly become, surprisingly, my new favorite deck. I definitely find myself pulling this one out to play more and more often against my friends or an LGS, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, why exactly is this deck my favorite, what does it want to do, and who in the world is the Commander for it? Well, let's jump into it to find out. Okay, actually, I just got a little bit ahead of myself. I forgot to mention that this is a very budget-friendly deck, every single card in it, including the commander, is less than $1. So with all that said, now let's jump into it. And just as I said that this deck surprised me with how much I enjoyed it, the commander, which is Gigantha, might surprise you as well. When I was building this deck, I was looking for a five color commander that was, well, to be honest, not all that threatening. Now, while also not being all that threatening though, I wanted a five color commander that could also provide me some value. I mean, the five color commander Chromat might be, you know, not threatening either, but it really doesn't provide you much, if any, value. Res Gigantha does provide some value, but it's not going to put a huge target on your back. Currently, according to EDH Rec, it is one of the least played five color commanders at just 467 decks. But again, unlike Sliver Legion, Atogatog, Chromat, and Sliver Queen, it's going to provide value in this kind of a deck. And I guess unlike Sliver Queen, it's not $300, it's only 87 cents currently, so yeah, there's that too. Regardless, if you've never seen Gigantha before, it's a 5-5 Elemental Elk that costs 4 in a gruel. It has tap add Wooburg, this mana can't be spent to pay generic mana cost. So you can essentially only use the mana that it creates to pay for mana pips. So I definitely kept that in mind when making certain decisions for this deck, but this deck in all honesty wasn't built entirely around the commander. In fact, the commander is just a nice kind of addition. I'm not looking to use or abuse its ability to tap for basically up to 5 mana, I'm just looking to utilize it as a mana source that can help out. So if I can tap it and utilize 3 or 4 mana in a turn, great. But again, the deck is not built around the need to utilize all of that mana in a turn. Again, I'm not just running a bunch of 5 color spells, I'm running cards that I actually want to run that work well with this deck. That being said, yes, there are most definitely some multicolor creatures in this deck that this can really help us cast. So overall, again, Gigantha was chosen as the commander for this deck because it is not all that threatening. It's a five color commander that can provide us some value and it can help us with mana fixing and some ramp. And obviously, although Gigantha says companion, that basically doesn't really mean anything when it is the commander. But that being said, this deck actually does have a companion. And that would be Karuga the Macro Sage. Now, actually, when I first built this deck, I did not build it with a companion in mind. But as the deck came together, I made this slight tweak just to make it slightly more casual and actually slightly more slow. Because Karuga the Macro Sage is a 5-4 dinosaur hippo that costs 3 Simic Simic and its companion requirement is this. Your starting deck must contain only cards with converted mana cost 3 or greater and land cards. So essentially, the Dinosaur Hippo requires you to be slow. Your opponents might ramp with a Soul Ring on turn 1 or a Rampant Growth on turn 2, but you don't get to do that. But what you do get though is a creature that has, when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card for each other permanent you control with converted mana cost 3 or greater. And believe me, that is a fantastic effect on a creature that we've got access to every single game. And actually, just a quick reminder with how Companion now works, again, because Companion basically broke every single format except for Commander, but the rule changed everywhere, including Commander. The card does say, if this card is your chosen Companion, you may cast it once from outside the game, 
but we can ignore that because, well, they changed the rule. And because technically, according to the rules committee, there is no outside the game. Basically, you've got your companion, which you can get into your hand by paying three at sorcery speed as a special action. So overall, to actually cast Ruga, you pay three to get in your hand, then you pay its mana cost, so yeah, eight mana in total, but still, for that effect, it is well worth it in this deck. And again, that companion requirement just gives you an interesting deck building restriction to work around. Regardless, Ruga also works well with Gigantha because Gigantha can pay for two of its pips. Again, multicolored cards really come in handy in helping us utilize Gigantha's mana. Regardless, now that we've talked about our commander and our companion, let's talk about what this deck actually wants to do and why Karuga's ETB can be so effective in it. So the idea for this deck actually started off with one card that I have always wanted to build a deck around ever since I saw it. And that card is, of course, the Golden Pig of this deck, which is the number one card out of our 99. And the Golden Pig for this deck is Song of the World Soul. It's an enchantment for four white white, and it says, whenever you cast a spell, populate, which means that you create a token that's a copy of a creature token you control. Now, obviously, this card currently sees play in decks that are built around making a lot of tokens. Whether those are 4-4 Rhino tokens, or 1-1 Human tokens, or Elf tokens, whatever. Generally, you're just copying a creature token whenever you're casting a spell, and yes, that can be powerful. But I have always wanted to maximize the value of this card. Because instead of populating those typical tokens, I want to populate tokens of actual creatures. I want creatures that can be impactful on their own, but when you get multiple of them, the amount of value that you're getting from them can be absolutely absurd and terrifying for your opponents. So when you get one of those creatures out and you make a token copy of it and you've got this in play, your opponents are going to be in big trouble. Because then for every spell you cast, you can populate and make a copy of that incredibly powerful token. And maybe it's a creature that's got a very powerful ETB like Karuga. Now Karuga might not be the best example because it's legendary, so you're not going to get to keep both the token and the creature in play. But by keeping the token in play and then populating over and over and over again, you draw an absurd amount of cards. And of course, we've got plenty of powerful non-legendary creatures in this deck that have some incredibly impactful ETBs and effects, and yeah, the more and more of those creatures we get out, the more and more impactful they become. So yeah, for all those reasons and the fact that Song of the World Soul was the inspiration for this deck, it is most definitely the Golden Pig. And because this deck really likes Song of the World Soul and getting it out, we're going to be running some ways to get it. So of course, we've got some standard tutors like Diabolic Tutor and Razgast Right. they're going to get it into our hand. And then Mythos of Brokos can also help us get it, but helps us in a different way. It says if Blue Black was spent to cast this spell, search your library for a card, put that card in your graveyard, then shuffle your library, return it to two target permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. So we go get Song of the World Soul, put it into our graveyard, get it back, and another permanent as well. And we can also go search for it with cards like Plea for Guidance, Moonblast Cleric, and Netherborn Phalanx. Plea for Guidance says search your library for up to two enchantment cards, reveal them, and put them in your hand, then shuffle your library. So on top of getting Song of the World Soul, we also have some other fantastic enchantments that we'll get to here in a bit. So again, by utilizing the ETB on Moonblast Cleric, we can also get multiple enchantments. It says when it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an enchantment card, reveal it, then shuffle your library and put that card on top. And actually, Netherborn Phalanx can not only be a tutor for us, but a game-ending card as well. First off, it's got Transmute for one black black, so basically we pay that and then we discard this card and search our library for a card with the same converted mana cost, which is again six, same as Song of the World Soul, and we put that into our hand. So essentially this is a three mana tutor that can be really hard to stop. And again, it can be a game mender because it says whenever it enters the battlefield, each opponent's going to lose one life for each creature they control. So again, if we can make a token copy of this and then maybe populate that a couple of times, our opponents are, well, probably not going to last very long, especially if they're running a token deck or something like that. But how exactly are we going to get those token copies of the creatures that we want to get copies of? First up, let's start with Cackling Counterpart, Croaking Counterpart, and Replicate. Cackling Counterpart says create a token that's a copy of target creature you control, and it's got a flashback for 5 blue blue. So yeah, for just 3 mana, we can get a copy of one of our incredibly powerful creatures, and again, because it is a token, we can populate with it. Or I guess I should say, we can utilize the populate mechanic to make more copies of it. You know what I mean. Anyways, Croaking Counterpart is obviously an homage to Cackling Counterpart, and it is similar, but different. It says create a token that's a copy of target non-frog creature, except it's a 1-1 green frog. On top of that, it's got flashback for three green blue. So this one has a flashback cost that is cheaper than Cackling Counterpart, and we can actually target an opponent's creature as well. Well, granted that if it is not a frog. 
We're actually not running any frogs in our deck, but yeah, this can actually be just as effective, if not more effective than Cackling Counterpart. The fact that we only get a 1-1 doesn't really matter all that much for a lot of our creatures because, well, we mostly care about either the ETBs or the effects that they're going to be giving us. Regardless, next up there's Replicate, which says create a token that's a copy of target creature you control, so again, more so like Cackling Counterpart. But keep in mind, again, with these multicolored cards that they are much easier for us to cast because of Gigantha, so yeah, they can help us utilize that mana more effectively. Next up, let's go into some 4 and 5 mana copy cards with Phantom Steed, Vizier Many Faces, and Zender Split's Judgment. Phantom Steed has Flash when it enters the battlefield, exiling another target creature you control until it leaves the battlefield. Whenever Phantom Steed attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of the exiled creature, except it's an illusion issue with other types, sacrifice that token at the end of combat. And then Vizier Many Faces is a clone, but it's a different kind of clone. It does the standard, hey, I'm a 0 0, but when I come into play, I can become a copy of any creature on the battlefield. But it also has Embalm for 3 blue blue. So when we Embalm in from our graveyard, we're basically getting a token clone, which again can be very beneficial when we clone something impactful that we can then populate. And then Cinder Splint's Judgment says, for each player, we're going to choose friend or foe. Each friend creates a token that's a copy of a creature they control. Each foe returns a creature they control to its owner's hand. Yeah, most of the time we're going to be choosing foe for our opponents, and most definitely friend for us. Next up, we've got some clone spells that can give us multiple copies of things. Sahili's Artistry says choose one or both, create a token that's a copy of target artifact, and create a token that's a copy of target creature, except it's an artifact just with other types. Next up, let's talk about Stolen Identity. It says create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature, and it's got Cypher. Now, Cypher might not be all that well of a known mechanic, but it can be effective in the right circumstance. Basically, you can exile the spell encoded on a creature that you control. And then whenever that creature deals combat damage to a player, its controller may cast a copy of the encoded card without paying its mana cost. So if we cipher this onto something evasive, we can just keep casting clone spells over and over again with this. And speaking of casting a clone spell over and over again, Spitting Image is fantastic in this deck. It says create a token that's a copy of target creature, and it's got Retrace. Which basically means we can recast from our graveyard by paying its cost and by discarding a land card. Which, yeah, for a clone spell is going to be well worth it in this deck. And actually, one more thing that I should mention with these cards is that these actually can copy an opponent's creature as well. And sometimes, actually, an opponent might have the best clone target for us, especially when we've got populate effects in play. Regardless, when it comes to really utilizing our creatures, let's talk about cards like Seance, Con Pharaoh's Gift, and Nightmare Shepherd. Seance says, At the beginning of each upkeep, you may exile target creature card from your graveyard. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a spirit initiative with other types, exile at the beginning of the next end step. This is another one of those cards that I've really always wanted to find a place for. And believe me, it's incredibly impactful in this deck. On every single upkeep, including our opponents, we can basically get rid of a creature card in our graveyard and make a token copy of it. Now that token copy is going to go away, but if we can populate, we get a copy of that that won't go away. And also keep in mind that even if we can't populate that token, we can still utilize this to really use and abuse ETBs and LTBs of creatures that we've already lost. Next up, a somewhat similar yet different card is God Pharaoh's Gift. It says that beginning of combat on your turn, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard if you do create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 4-4 black zombie, it gains haste until end of turn. So whereas Seance happens on every single player's upkeep, this happens just during our combat. That being said, the token that we do get does stick around, so keep that in mind. And speaking of sticking around, Nightmare Shepherd says, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may exile it. If you do, create a token that's a copy of that creature, except say 1-1 and it's a Nightmare to its other types. So yeah, now actually our creatures dying can be a good thing. Although we essentially get rid of that creature and then we just get a 1-1 in replacement, well again, like I mentioned before, sometimes the creature being a 1-1 really isn't all that big of a deal. For example, if Karuga dies and we just get a 1-1 Karuga instead of a 5-4, who cares? We still get to draw all those cards. Pretty much for every single creature in this deck, the ETBs and their effects are what we care about. Regardless, next up we've got another creature that can help us make token copies with Fell in the Third Path. And as by paying two in red and tapping it, we get a token that's a copy of target creature card in our graveyard, except it's an artifact to other types, it gets haste, sacrifice to begin the next end step. So again, it does make a temporary copy, but again, if we can populate, the populated token is going to stay. Speaking of which, Mimic Vat is somewhat similar in a way. It says whenever a non-token creature dies, you may exile that card. If you do return each other card exiled, Mimic back to its owner's graveyard. And then with that imprint, we can pay three in tap and create a token that's a copy of the card that's exiled with Mimic Vat. It gets haste, exile the beginning of the next end step. Next up though, there's Hate Mirage, which says choose up to two target creatures you don't control. For each of those creatures, create a token that's a copy of that creature. Those tokens gain haste, exile them begin the next end step. Yeah, this little four mana card can do a ton of work for you. Being able to make token copies of your opponent's most powerful creatures, and then again, if you can populate or just copy them with other spells, you're going to have those tokens stay around. The new ones, I mean. 
You know what I meant. Regardless, two of the best copy spells in this deck might just be Mythos of Iluna and Replication Technique. Mythos of Iluna says, create a token that's a copy of target permanent. If red green was spent to cast this spell, instead create a token that's a copy of a permanent except the token has. When this permanent enters the battlefield, if it's a creature, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. Now that fighting is nice if we copy a creature, but the most important part about this is that we can literally copy anything on the battlefield. And my favorite target to copy is, of course, Song of the World Soul because things can get really out of control when you've got two of those in play and every single spell that you cast lets you populate twice. Or you know, if you cast Replication Technique, things can get even crazier. It's a sorcery that has Demonstrate, so basically you can get an extra copy of this spell as long as you have an opponent get a copy of it as well. It says create a token that's a copy of target permanent you control. So again, by getting this twice, let's get two copies of Song of the World Soul and now every single spell that we cast has us populate three times. Yeah, once you're set up, things can get out of control really quickly. And speaking of getting set up, let's talk about other ways to populate outside of Song of the World Soul. Now, populate is actually a mechanic that I really wish had more support. That being said, some fantastic populate cards for this deck are Growing Ranks, Trostani Selesnya's voice in Geared Conclave Exile. Growing Ranks says, at the beginning of your upkeep, populate. Again, depending on what you've got a token copy of, that can be an absurd amount of value. Next up, Trostani Selesnya's voice says, whenever the creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain life equal that creature's toughness, and it has pay one green white, tap, populate. And actually, an ability like that can be a really good way to make sure that you're utilizing Gigantha's mana. If you don't have any green or white spells to spend that mana on, well, just utilize it to populate. Next up, there's Geared who has, when it enters the battlefield, create a 4-4 green rhino creature token with trample. And whenever it attacks, you're going to populate, and the token enters the battlefield, tapped and attacking. But the best of these populate effects, well, outside of Song of the World Soul, very well might be Selesnya Uologist. And as pay 2 and a green, exile target creature card from a graveyard, then populate. A repeatable populate effect like this one that doesn't require you to tap can be incredibly impactful. And obviously, it can be extra impactful against reanimator decks or decks that want to use and abuse their graveyard. One last populate effect that we have, though, actually comes on Ripborn Defenses, which says populate creatures you control gain indestructible until end of turn. So this not only protects our creatures, but it also gives us an extra token. And then Lockstead and Hierarch is another way for us to protect our board, and this actually might be a creature that we might want to populate as well. It has when it enters the battlefield, you gain 4 life, and by paying green-white by sacrificing it, you regenerate each creature you control. So this is some nice life gain, as well as board-white protection. Speaking of which, Ready can help us protect our board as well. It says creatures you control are indestructible this turn, untap each creature you control. And then Willing says creatures you control gain death touch and lifelink until end of turn. So that's just a nice additional benefit to have in case we really want to make our creatures incredibly deadly and gain a lot of life. And speaking of deadly creatures, let's talk about some fantastic clone targets that we really want to populate with cards like Master Biomancer, Boltwing Marauder, and Consuming Aberration. Master Biomancer is a 2-4 that says each other creature you control enters the battlefield with a number of additional plus plus one counters on it equal to Master Biomancer's power and is a mutant in addition with other types. Now that mutant part really doesn't matter all that much, but yeah, this can get out of hand if you start making token copies of this. Because when you make one token copy of Master Biomancer, that token's going to come into play and get two counters on it thanks to the original Master Biomancer. Then let's say you get another Master Biomancer in play. You're going to get those two counters from the original Master Biomancer, and then from that token copy, because its power is four, you're going to get four more counters on that new copy. Which means the newest Master Biomancer has eight power, and yeah, you see where this is going. Basically, any of your creatures that are going to be coming into play come in as monsters. And speaking of making creatures monsters, Boltwing Marauder says, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, target creature gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. So yeah, by getting multiple token copies of this, that's going to be multiple triggers, and you can make one creature massive and dish out a lot of damage. And of course, luckily for us, Boltwing Marauder has flying itself, so yeah, we can get this through on a lot of opponents. But the biggest creature in this deck has got to be Consuming Aberration. It's a star star that has power toughness each equal to the number of cards in your opponent's graveyards. On top of that, whenever you cast a spell, each opponent reveals cards in the top of their library until they reveal a land card, then put those cards in their graveyards. So the more and more copies you get of this in play, the more and more cards your opponents mill every single time you cast a spell. And then the bigger each of your aberrations get, and they become massive in absolutely no time. So yeah, you can most definitely kill your opponents through combat damage with this, but you can also do it by just, you know, milling them out. If you get a copy of this and then you keep populating it over and over and over again, you're going to be milling your opponents for a ton of cards and they're going to be done. And speaking of done, another fantastic game ender is Grey Merchant of Asphodel, better known as Gary. Gary has, when it enters the battlefield, each opponent loses X life for X is your devotion to black, you gain life, you life loss this way. 
Now, obviously, this deck is not mono black, which is typically the decks that you'll see Gary in. That being said, that doesn't mean that we can't make the most of Gary and get a ton of devotion entering our opponents for an absurd amount. We may have already gotten some black pips in play and populated creatures that have those black pips, or, you know, we can just get Gary in play, make a copy of it, and start populating more and more. Because again, those copy tokens still have the mana cost of the creature they're copying. So for each additional Gary that we get, we're going to be draining for two more than we did last time. Next up though, another incredibly brutal way to take out our opponents can most definitely be with Stalking Vengeance. It's a 5-5 with haste and says whenever the creature you control dies, it deals damage equal to its power to target player. So the more copies of this that you get, the more damage that you're going to be dishing out when any of your creatures die. Good luck to your opponents trying to board wipe and not be taken out. But next up we've got Scholar of the Lost Trove, which can be absolutely absurd in this deck. It has, when it enters the battlefield, you may cast target instant sorcery or artifact card from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If an instant or sorcery spell casts this way between your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. So obviously that's just a good amount of value on its own, but if we can copy this and then populate that token, yeah, that can get absurd. Especially with Song of the World Soul, which basically then just lets us cast essentially all of our instants and sorceries and artifacts from our graveyard. Because we'd get one, we'd populate, we'd make a token copy of Scott of the Lost Trove, and then we'd get that trigger again, casting another card, and then we do it again, and again, and again. So that's a lot of 5-5 five, five flyers and a lot of spells cast. And speaking of a 5-5 five, five flyer, next up there's Diluvian Primordial. It has when it enters the battlefield for each opponent, you may cast up to one target insert sorcery card from that player's graveyard that paying its mana cost. So whereas Skull of the Lost Trove gives us value from our graveyard, this gives us value from our opponents. And speaking of which, of course, we're going to be utilizing some of the other primordials as well, like Sepulchral Primordial and Molten Primordial. Sepulchral has when it enters the battlefield for each opponent, you may put up to one target creature card from that player's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. And then Molten Primordial says when it enters the battlefield for each opponent, gain control up to one target creature that player controls until end of turn, untap those creatures that gain haste until end of turn. So with these cards, we can utilize our opponent's creatures and turn them against them. Speaking of which, we'll also be running Carter Doomscourge. Now, this one is a legendary creature, and keep in mind that when we make a token copy of it, well, we can't keep both of them because the legend rule applies. So for the most part, I avoid utilizing legendary creatures, though obviously I am utilizing some that are incredibly powerful. And Cardor's ETB is just that. It has when it enters the battlefield until your next turn, creatures your opponents control attack each combat of Fable and attack a player other than you of Fable. Essentially, on ETB, goad all of your opponent's creatures. And on top of that, whenever an attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So by copying this and making a token of it, you basically get that goad effect again. And keep in mind with this and with Karuga and pretty much any of the legendary creatures that you're going to be copying and cloning, you're going to want to keep the copy. Because again, that token can be populated. Oh, and Carter also just happens to have whenever an attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life, so that's some nice additional value too. Regardless, next up we've got another way to get rid of our opponent's creatures with Overseer of the Damned. It has when it enters the battlefield, you may destroy target creature, and whenever a non-token creature in opponent controls dies, create a tap 2-2 black zombie creature token. Getting multiple copies of this can get out of control in no time. First off, you get that ETB, which is fantastic taking out a creature. But again, when you've got multiple copies of this, for every single copy that you have, whenever a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you get a 2-2 black zombie creature token for every single Overseer of the Dam that you have. Regardless, next up there's Ashen Rider, which is an incredible card in this deck. It has flying, and whenever it enters the battlefield or dies, exile target permanent. So, yeah, getting some additional copies of this is brutal. Every single copy you get is going to be exiling an opponent's permanent. And then when any of them die, you get to exile a permanent too. And again, on top of that, each of these are 5-5 five, five flyers, and I guess Overseer of the Damned is too, so yeah, you can get a lot of damage through these creatures as well. Next up, let's round up our removal with things like Brutalizer Exarch, Knight of Autumn, and Reclamation Sage. Brutalizer Exarch is a 3-3 three, three, and it has when it enters the battlefield, choose one, search your library for a creature card revealed, then shuffle your library and put that card on top of it, or put target non-creature permanent on the bottom of its owner's library. So this can most definitely be some fantastic removal, but you can actually utilize it to tutor as well if you want to get a specific creature. And keep in mind that if you want Song of the World Soul, just tutor for that one creature, Netherborn Phalanx, that can actually tutor for Song of the World Soul. And then Knight of Autumn also has a flexible ETB. It has when it enters the battlefield, choose one, put two plus plus one encounters on Knight of Autumn, destroy target artifact or enchantment, or you gain four life. And finally, Reclamation Sage is not flexible, but still fantastic. When it enters the battlefield, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment. Again, as you've probably seen, this deck has plenty of ways to use and abuse these ETBs to get the most out of them. But now that we've talked about what this deck wants to do, let's talk about how we actually get things set up properly. Now, in this deck, although we can only have three CMC and above cards, we actually have two cards that can help us ramp early. 
Search for tomorrow has to spend two for a green, and it says search your life for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield, then shuff your library. And then Rift Sower is somewhat similar. It's got to spend two for a green, it can tap dead one mana of any color. So suspending each of these can be fantastic turn one plays for this deck. Next up, we also have some other creatures that can help us ramp with Farhaven Elf and Springbloom Druid. Farhaven Elf has an ETB that's going to get us a basic land into play tapped. And then Springbloom Druid's going to make us sacrifice one land to go get two basics into play tapped. Next up, we also going to be utilizing a lot of enchant land ramp. So cards like Overgrowth, Gift of Paradise, Glittering Frost, New Horizons, Verdant Haven, Weirding Wood, and Dawn's Reflection can come in huge for this deck. Again, keep in mind that Karuga's ETB cares about permanence in play, so having these permanents as our ramp can really help us out. Instead of just using typical land ramp like maybe a Cultivate, having one of these in play can draw us an extra card. And speaking of card advantage, let's talk about cards like Skullwinder, Combustible Gearhawk, and Garrick's Pack Leader. Skullwinder has, when it enters the battlefield, return target card from your graveyard to your hand, then choose an opponent, and that player returns a card from their graveyard to their hand. And the Combustible Gearhawk is a 6-6 with First Strike that has, when it enters the battlefield, target opponent may have you draw three cards. If the player doesn't, you mill three cards, then it deals damage to that player equal to the total mana value of those cards. Again, we have some pretty high converted mana cost cards in this deck, so your opponents are probably going to be pretty wary in actually choosing not to give you those cards. But next up, there's Garrick's Pack Leader, and this kind of card draw can be absolutely absurd. It's a 4-4 beast that has whenever the creature with power 3 or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. By getting multiple copies of this in play, first off, you're going to draw whenever those copies come into play, and you're going to draw a ton of cards now when any creature with power 3 or greater, which is a lot of your creatures, comes into play. And speaking of drawing and power, let's talk about Teamer Ascendancy, Shamanic Revelation, and Return of the Wild Speaker. Teamer Ascendancy says, Creature you control have haste, which is always nice to have, and it says whenever a creature with power 4 or greater enters the battlefield under your control, you may draw a card. Shamanic Revelation is going to draw a card for each creature we control, and we gain 4 life for each creature we control with power 4 or greater which again is going to be quite a few of them. And then Return of the Wild Speaker says, draw cards equal to the greatest power among non-human creatures you control, or non-human creatures you control get plus three plus three until end of turn. So this can be a mass draw spell or a mass pump effect for us. And yeah, in this deck, we only have three humans in it with Girid, Felden, and the Moonblessed Cleric. So obviously it's going to help out quite a few of our creatures or help us draw a lot of cards from them. But now that we've talked about every single non-land card in this deck, let's talk about the price. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, every single card in this deck, including the commander, and actually including the companion as well, is less than $1. So the total estimated cost for this deck is just $30.58. And keep in mind that that actually includes the cost of basic lands at $0.10 cents a piece, so if you already have those basic lands, well, there's some extra savings there. And speaking of extra savings, if you utilize TCG Player to buy heavily played and damaged cards, you can save more there as well. Because, as you know, even heavily played in damage cards need a home too. Also keep in mind though that this estimated cost does not include the cost of shipping, which might vary depending upon where you live. Regardless, yeah, this deck has definitely become quickly my favorite deck to pull out and play. It's a deck that's looking to take things slow at first and start off as a non-threatening deck, and then all of a sudden you're set up and you can do some incredible things. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode, and for those of you that are going to try out this deck as well, I hope that you enjoy playing it just as much as I do. And with that, the show has come to a close, so it's my turn here from you. So in the comments below, let me know your thoughts on this episode are, and as always, thanks again and have a good one.